Well, hi everyone. Um, welcome once again uh, to uh, the afternoon session, like the second part of the afternoon session. Um, it's been nice interacting with you all, and I hope that, I mean, all the other talks that followed, um, um, I mean, that's come in this session will be insightful to you all. Um, we have Brett Morgan, um, who will be speaking to us on building a Flutter app for Ubuntu. Um, he'll be telling us a bit more about himself. Let's appreciate him. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. Is this mic on? Can you hear me? Hello, is that better? Okay. Can you hear me now? I'll just have to hold myself in this pretzel position. Anyway, hello, I'm Brett Morgan. Who am I? I'm Flutter Developer Relations at Google, which basically means it's my job to talk to all of you guys about Flutter. Um, I've been a DRE, which is Developer Relations Engineer, at Google for a number of years now. So much so, I'm part of the furniture. I've worked on a number of products, some of which are no longer standing. <sighs> Prior to Google, I did 10 years in industry. Yes, that's right. We consider working at Google not to be an industry. Make your jokes about academia right there. Um, and prior to that, I was, I was a system administrator on Solaris. Um, if you have no idea what a boff is, look around for the people who are snigging, uh, sniggering and ask them. I'm not going to explain it on tape. And due to my sins, I carry a pager. So yes, my day job can, consists mainly of writing iOS apps in Flutter, but I still know what a Linux box is in the cloud, so don't judge me. So I want to talk about a uh, sort of a weekend hack that sort of took over my life for a little while. I wrote a, a little basic app that created um, mazes out of a book, and it was all, all written in Ruby, so I was having this whole fun game of converting from Ruby code into, into a real program language. Sorry, oops, I just set some people on fire. Um, and what I wound up with is this. So what I'd like to do is basically demonstrate to you guys how to take a basic library that just generates some data structures and turn it into an application and do it in about 20 minutes. Uh, actually, make that about 18 minutes. Uh, let's not go there yet. As I sit here and prove that I don't actually use Linux on, on a daily basis. Okay. So, here's the world's simplest Hello World program in Flutter. We've got an import statement where we're depending on some library stuff to make painting stuff easy. We've got ye old traditional main method. And then we have an application, which is a stateless widget. You'll hear me talk a lot about stateless versus stateful widgets. Um, the basic difference is a stateful widget has state, and a stateless widget is basically just a declaration. You're basically saying to Flutter, I want it to look like this, make it look like this. Do whatever is required in the back end to all that sort of GPU stuff to make it look like this. So um, now to talk about, get on, bugger off here. Now to, to show off the, the, the upside of Flutter. I can turn around and I've got this wonderful hello world that's saying hello to you all, but you can't actually see it. So we turn around and change the size of it and go, there, you can actually see it now. All I've done is written some code, hit save, and the application changes. But of course, you know, yeah, I don't like the fact that it's not lined up, so add some more code and it centers it all. I'll actually move a few things around. There we go, that looks better. Okay, so this is an application, but it doesn't really look like a, an Ubuntu application, and I, I said I'd make one for a Linux desktop, so let's start doing that. First thing I'm gonna do is add an app bar. Ooh, that's not improving things. So what I'm gonna do, get rid of that text, I don't need it. I'm gonna start relying on some Yuru theming. So I'm gonna introduce the Yuru um, package. This actually has some native code, so the next step may or may not work. I wrap everything in Yuru and, okay. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I just need to shoot the app and start it again. <laughs> Not just you, okay. And this is why I have a little mouse here so that I can do that. 
Okay, now that we've got the Yuru theme in our tree and it's actually loaded, I can now turn around and start. Actually, this is an important question. Um, wrapping the Yuru theme around the material uh, app doesn't give us access to something we kind of need. So what we're doing is a pattern you'll see quite often in Flutter, builder methods. So what's happening here is Yuru theme on build, i.e. when the build method is called, has its own builder method, so it will then call, it will call this function. I know it doesn't look like this, but this is actually a function. So it can pass this Yuru theme data which it has just constructed. Um, there are other ways to get that theme data object, but when we're writing it like this, uh, we need to use a builder method. You'll see it in list context and things like that. Oh, hey, it's now starting to look like a desktop app. And if we give it the dark one, because it's a Linux machine, it's always dark, right? So there we go. Starting to look more desktop by the second. So now I'm going to start building in a bit of a data structure. I have a number of maze algorithms, so the obvious thing to do is have an enumeration of the mazes, or the maze algos. So let's turn around and have a couple. Um, but, you know, traditionally, up until fairly recently, this was as far as you could push in nums. But as of Dart 2.17, we can add things to them. <coughs> so now we have some, some names to actually display them. Uh, let's actually add some icons as well. Whee! Now, it's great having some algorithms with some names and some, some icons. Wouldn't be nice if we could put it on the page. Let's rely on another package, Yuru Widgets. Gives us a little lovely thing called Yuru Tabbed Page. We put that in, we get some icons and some titles and some views, and boom, we have the start of a desktop app. Now, the neat thing here is there's actually some reactivity. I was in a previous talk where people are asking what happens if you want something that looks great as a mobile app and as a desktop app, how do you deal with it? Well, you use widgets that actually re respond to how wide they are. Or you write it yourself, one or the other. <coughs> okay, that's great. Uh, but it'd be nice to actually have a maze, right? So I happen to have written a library, as I was telling you, as my weekend project, which has a bunch of maze algorithms. So let's rely on that. The thing that I'm going to do here, I'm actually creating, <coughs> recreating effectively, the API that my library has. And I'm declaring it locally so I can, I can actually call it. My library just had a bunch of things that obeyed this uh, requirement, didn't, but I hadn't named it there. So now I can add that to my enum, put them in. So while it does that and crashes, yes, I've log logged a bug about that. One of the joys of using new features is sometimes they trip over and die. this back. Okay. So what we've got here is we have a function takes rows and columns, which will turn around and do a good software engineering practice and actually create a, a variable at the top of the, the code that, so that we can easily change it. And it retur returns this mazes grid. Why is it mazes grid? Well, one of the great things you can do when you're importing a package, like in Python and various other places, you can actually name that import so that you all the names in it are quarantined off. Because I'm, I obviously want to use uh, the maze name for things, and that library also declares maze for various things, so I turn around and namespace it, and now it's safe. Okay, let's start painting some boxes. Ah, uh, thank you. Yes. So we now have a maze display. So it's gonna take a, where are we? I uh, haven't got that far yet. Let's turn around and give it a, a um, get that out of the way, the maze generator. So that's the, uh, the function that we turn around and give it rows and columns, gives us back a maze. We're going to do a fun thing with it. Of course, as I said, rows and columns. And we just turn around and we've wired this in so that the maze generator is passed through. So this box is now instantiated, but we're going to do something fun with it. So previously I said we've got stateless versus stateful widgets. 
And this is a case where we've got a stateful widget and we're doing something useful with it. So we've got a stateful widget in maze display, which we've, it fills up this space here. But we've got this init state method. And what this is doing is when you put a stateful widget into the tree, the runtime basically looks at it and goes, I've never seen this object before in the tree. I will ask it to generate me a state object and I'll hang on to it. Because remember, the, uh, the widget tree is set up so that you can create it and destroy it rapidly, but you want to not have the state change. In this case, it would be which maze are we displaying. Um, if you don't do this and you just create state like this that is semi-permanent in your uh, tree, you'll wind up with fun things where everything changes whenever you, oh, I don't know, change the color of the theme or change the size of your window. So it's important to figure out how long things live and where you're going to store them. Whether it's the top of the tree or part way down the tree or outside the tree completely and inject it using, uh, say, river pod or provider or block or whatever. There's a number of things there not going there. Um, but one of the things that has happened, and this was actually touched in a previous talk, if I just go ahead at this point, eh, we'll see an error. So one of the problems is, and I kind of did this on purpose, I created the state object, I instantiated the widget into the tree, then I changed the init method. It's kind of important when you do that sort of thing that instead of just doing a hot reload, you do a full reload because hot reloads effectively re taking the new code into the running image, force a repaint, but they don't rerun things like the main method or init state methods. So if your init state method has changed, you kind of need to do a full reload. So I hear that a bit from Flutter developers. They're not sure when hot reload works and when it doesn't reload. Strange enough, it's all documented on the website, but just thought I'd say it again. Okay. So now we have a fully instantiated state object. We're not tripping over <coughs> uh, null constraints. Actually, I'll go back one step, introducing something else here. So something else that we added to the language fairly recently. So we have column, children. So a column takes children. We're going to the data structure here is that a grid consists of a list of rows, each of which is a list of children, i.e. the columns. And what I'm going to do is take it in and paint a column with a set of rows in it, with a set of text boxes in it, and that's going to be the start of the grid. So, <coughs> what's happening here and why this code looks a bit weird is that we've actually got a for loop inside of a list context. We've got a variety of things we can do here. We can do for loops, we can do conditionals. It, it just makes it easier to create trees of objects. Okay, next trick. Got a bunch of numbers on the screen. Why have I got a bunch of numbers on the screen? Well, up here in the init method, I've got this code. So I'm actually doing a, uh, a walk of the grid starting at the top left corner and going, that's box zero, and whatever's connected is one away from it, anything that's two away from it. So what you actually have here is a complete grid, but it's kind of illegible. So let's fix that. Column, so I've centered it. So the next trick is people frequently take columns and rows and center them and go, why did nothing change? That's because columns and rows take max height unless you say the magical, um, main axis size min, there, we, there we've got a grid. Uh, well, it's centered at least. It'd be nice if the grid actually had some walls. That's pretty easy to do. Let's, let's start with the cell size and wrap everything in a size box. Uh, so everything's actually now grid shapes. You can actually see where the different numbers are. But what would be nice is we had container with uh, walls on it, which we can easily do with the box decoration. There's a slight problem though. The box decoration is by default black. The theme's background scheme is by default gray. You can't see a darn thing. It'd be nice if, oh, I don't know, we had a theme. 
that we got from Yuru theme that gave us the ability to have a primary color. There we go. Okay, we've got a grid. Only one slight problem. Uh, these numbers, well, firstly, they're not centered, which is setting me my OCD write off. But secondly, we've got these boxes that are obviously connected by the numbers, but there's a wall there. Well, let's fix that. There we go, we've centered the numbers. And now we're gonna start drawing in the individual walls. We're looking into the data structure and going, is this cell connected to the cell above me? If not, paint a wall, so on and so forth. We can put in the other four walls. And there, we actually have a grid, we have a maze. Um, slight problem, the outside wall is too thin. So there's an easy fix for that. Wrap the whole thing in a container and give it also a box decoration. And now the numbers are just noise. So let's strip them out. Oh, hey, we've got a maze. We've got a whole bunch of different mazes. Um, fun question for you all. What because I know there's a couple of people here who, oh, I don't know, did comp sci in, in university. Why is this one called the binary tree? Think about it. Anyway, back to writing code. What did I just do? Oh yeah, don't need the grids anymore, we can get rid of that. So the next problem we have is this orange. Sure, it might be great and all because it's Ubuntu orange, but what if I want a different color? Well, there's an easy answer for that. And something I frequently get asked about when people see me do one of these live code demos, they go, you've written all the code in one file. Can Flutter only deal with code in one file? It's like, no, actually, if we have a look, I have a second file here with a whole bunch of code in it. And I can turn around and import it. Yes, you, it, it's probably nicer to put it in a subdirectory called, oh, I don't know, source and do all sorts of nice things. But no, for the point of the exercise, I have some code. And I can de depend on it. And now I have an action on the title bar which is hiding under here. But we've got some colors. They don't do anything and that debug is annoying so let's get rid of that. By the way, please don't tell Tim that I told you how to do that. He gets really angry with, with people taking away that because it shows off a vital state information about the app. But it's in the way of the button so I don't want it there. Anyway. It'd be nice to, oh, I don't know, have that button do something, which means we need to do something important, break the system. So what did I just do and why is the system cranky with me? I'll take it back so you can watch it again. Come on. No, no. So previously, Maze app was stateless, which is great and all uh, because it had no state, but now I want to have the ability to have a variable, i.e., which is the selected variant, so that I can pass that into Yuru theme, which means I'm converting Maze app from being stateless to stateful. And when you do that, things get cranky. So back to our friend, full reload. Ba -ding. So now I have, I've converted it to stateful. It's a stateful widget. Maze app state is split out as a separate object. Now I can go ahead, oops, don't change the actual file, that one. You can go as well, okay. So I can now introduce uh, Yuru variant in as state into the stateful object, or into the state object, associated object. And don't know if you saw it, we've got Yuru th theme takes it in. Um, about the only thing we need to do is fill in, <coughs> fill in the on selected button, and we should have the ability to change colors. I don't. I, it's probably not obvious from where you guys are sitting, but that color change is actually animated. Uh, it's fun to sit there and think about how it is that a sim simple change where I'm passing in a new declaration saying, this is a new theme color, animates. It's one of those, when you figure it out, you understand so much more about, about Flutter. 
Okay. So, six minutes to go. It's going to be a bit of a f uh, fun ride. Let's introduce another stateful object. So this time we're going to do it all again, just to drive it all home. But this time, instead of a single grid, we're going to have a slew of them. We're going to have about 400-ish, depending on the algorithm. We're taking an animation generator that generates a list of frames. And we're going to wire it in so our previous grids go away. We have the animation, and we're going to do that thing where we ch change the init state method. It's already instantiated, so we need to do a full hot reload. Yes, I'll keep doing that so that people remember. And now the fun part. We're doing an animation. We've got a data structure here that's got 400 frames. We want to turn around and step through it. And an easy way, there are multiple ways of doing this. I explored at least five of them while I was coming up with this talk. This is probably the shortest. What's a tween animation? Tween is an animation that goes between two things, thus the name. Blame animators. It wasn't programmers that came up with that name. So it's an int tween, so it goes from zero to one less than the number of frames we have because off by one errors. Yes, I tripped over that. The duration, you can set it to what you want. We'll be good programmers in a minute and actually pull that out as a configurable. And we have a builder which turns around and fill, tells Maze Display, please display this grid. Except Maze Display, as we've currently got it written, takes a generator. Let's fix that. Strip it out. We have a maze. Oops. How did that stop? Yeah. So now we can switch between different mazes. And for some reason, it's going all janky on me. It's never done that before. Ah, demo gods. What did I do to upset you? OK. As previously mentioned, do the appropriate thing. Put the configurable at the top so that you can change it easily. And that's the end of the demo. So back to the slides. Doo -doo -doo. So if you're interested in Flutter, or moreover, here's some things that I work on as my day job, um, we have a bunch of code labs that consist of Flutter ones. So if you go to codelabsdevelopers.google.com, go to this area on the left, and scroll down. Once you expand it, select the thing with Flutter. All those code labs that come up, I'm the one who maintains them. So if you've got a problem with them, chat with me and tell me how I've, I've broken it, and I'll fix it. The other thing I play with it is a small project called dartpad.dev. If you have a problem and you want to demo it to someone, a really easy way is you go in here, click the GitHub button, type some code in, say, save as gist, and then you have a URL that you can share with people. And I'm responsible for the computational back end that updates itself, updates itself. Did I mention I carry a pager? Um, about every week as we change, collect master and beta and stable and all sorts of things. Have a play. It's a good way of demoing things to people without having to install things. If this dive through mazes has intrigued you, please check out James's Buck's book. His, his book was the one that I uh, played with to get these algorithms out. If you're interested in diving into Flutter itself, Flutter Apprentice is a great book. And that's it. Any questions? Three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I went a bit faster than expected. All right. <laughs> Using uh, the enums, as you saw it, uh, rather than a class and a bunch of, of uh, constants or finals. I'm not quite understanding that question. Well, you, it sounds you, like we should have a longer talk. But yeah, well, you, 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 <coughs> you define the enums with titles and stuff and all kinds of properties inside the enum. And you ha I have properties in that. Wait, <laughs> I'll go back to my code. Yeah, and go back to your code. You yeah. did a bunch of enums. All right, uh, enums. Uh, yeah, enums. What's the advantage of enums? Uh, yes, that, those, those ones. What's the, what's the advantage of using enum maze and have all that rather than have a, a class maze and then lots of constants? Right. What's the advantage of an enum over classes? Um, one, I was mainly doing this to show off the fact that enums were better than they used to be. Okay. Secondly, in cases where you're doing a case switch statement, you can the compiler oh, okay. will do completeness checking for you, yeah. right. um, or you force you to have a default case, uh, hmm. things like that. Um, again, this is this is data modeling. We're getting into 
how permanent is the data that you're playing with? Is it, is it constant for all time, or is it something you should really be pulling from a disk or an API server? Which is hilariously a, a question I got asked fairly recently for a project we're running at Google. So yes. Thanks. Uh, how big is the Flutter uh, executable, and what do I need on my Linux system to run it? I'm, you're going to have to speak up. I'm having trouble okay. hearing you, sir. How big is the executable, and what do I need on my Linux system to run it, the maze? Is anyone picking that up? I'm, I'm having How big is the executable? How big is the executable? That depends on whether you're running in development mode or production mode. And I haven't looked at Linux, um, but I'd be, I'm, I'm guessing there's some people in the room that actually know the answer to this question. Five megs? Five megs sounds about right. That's where we are at on mobile. So on the order of five megs for a small lap in, in production build, I keep nominating that because in the development build, you have a full VM, which makes the whole thing a lot bigger. So if you come to me and go, hello world is 30 megs, I'll go, hit the production button. I, it looks like you more or less um, hard-coded the Yaru theme in there. Is it possible to dynamically select that at runtime? Like look at what theme, look at what system theme the user's got selected and... Uh, and what do you mean I hard-coded the Yaru theme? Scroll up to, scroll up to where you had the theme. It, it look, well, uh, so like line, yeah, line 29 there. Line 29. Yeah. So what if the user was using like um, Adwaita or something, the default GTK theme? Like would, would it be possible to make that dynamic? So that, you, so that these apps could be a kind of still on GNOME but kind of cross, cross GNOME, not, not Ubuntu specific, if you see what I mean. So it's about now that I point out that I've been using your root theme for approximately a week now. <laughs> because I went, I should write a Linux app for this talk that I'm giving. Um, there are, however, some p canonical uh, Linux people in Who the Who are room. those guys? Do um, this. <coughs> uh, yes, so you would probably write a new theme called Linux theme that would then have, that would dynamically choose between the Yaru theme and Ad Adwaita theme, which would be a new one. Thank you. All right, um, thank you, Bert. I'm here all week. If you've got any questions, come hassle me.